lift every voice and sing till earth and heaven ring, ring with the harmonies of liberty. Let our rejoicing rise. Thank you for joining us. We are the NAACP Forum. We're back again with our political series, and I am happy to have in the studio today Wynn Farwell, first term uh, city council member at large, but not new to the Brockton political scene. He's a former mayor, last left office in 1996, and has been off the radar for about 20 years, but has come back to represent the greatness of the city. Wynn Farwell, thank you for being here with the NAACP My pleasure. today. Thank you very much. So pleasure you, to be here. Are you running for re-election? Yes. Is this, is this your first time speaking of it? Have you formally announced it elsewhere? I did announce in the newspaper, but this is the first, shall we say, television uh, announcement that we are a candidate for renomination and re-election. So we're the first? You are the first. We appreciate Numero having you. Uno, so. <laughs> so you know how we have these conversations. We basically, uh, it's like being in my living room. Um, we are, are, are pretty much like a social conversation. I make it easy, but I got to ask you the magic question. Why are you running for re-election? Well, number one, I like what I do. And, and I think a lot of people may wonder, why do people run for re-election? Yes, and yes, I, and right. I think after you've served as mayor, uh, you really have to have a, a fever for this because government is tough. It's uh, limited resources, challenging issues. You can't please everyone. But I thoroughly enjoy what I do, and I also enjoy the other counselors. It, you know, when you're the mayor, you're somewhat isolated in an office. Right. But when you're a counselor, you have 10 other people, and you can rely on their observations. You can rely on their background because they're different than you. So it's a learning experience. So and you, I, oh, I'm sorry. No, no, so I, you, believe it's a, you believe it's a team environment? Oh, I do believe it's a team environment, yes. I, that, now, that does not mean that we will always vote the way all counselors vote. But it's a team in the sense you listen to one another, you learn from the experiences that they bring to the table, and at the end of the day, which is so good about this council, mm -hmm. we're all friends. Even if the vote goes 6-5, 7-4, 8-3, when that meeting is over, unlike Washington, right. we all talk to one another. We look forward to the next meeting. We look forward to the materials that we'll receive for the next council meeting. And, and I think that makes for a very productive group. So, you know, I crisscrossed the city. I hear a lot of negatives. I hear a lot of positives as well. But I need to hear from our politicians. What is right about Brockton? Well, I think the people are right. We, we, this is a very down-to-earth, hard-working city. Um, we have people that have two jobs. Right. We have right. uh, two people in the family both work. So I think it's a group that appreciates what they have in life, if they own a home or if they live in an apartment. I think they appreciate the different uh, cultural aspects of the city, whether it be restaurants or the uh, museum on Oak Street, which certainly is uh, an unheralded but I think very valuable asset. Mm -hmm. We do have an excellent police and fire department, mm -hmm. notwithstanding the fact that I do think we need more resources there. Uh, and on balance, if you look at Brockton, and I know we have crime, and I know we have articles that appear in the newspaper, right. but we're really no different than any other city. I mean, if you honestly right. look at it, we're no different. The issues here are the issues elsewhere. It's really how we collectively work together to address them that I right. think makes for a positive environment. So you mentioned crime, and we were going to uh, talk a little bit about public safety. So this, this, uh, the conversation that you hear in a community that uh, Brockton is a bad city, Brockton is a crime-ridden city, do you buy that? What's your take on uh, the issues of public safety in the city of Brockton? I, I do think, unfortunately, that's the perception, it and, is and, perception, I, and I will right. tell you why I think that is. When I first joined the police department in 1975, if you had a shot fired in the city, it would be front page news in the enterprise. Mm. Now, unfortunately, and we see this across the country, in the last 25, 30, 35 years, guns have become more prevalent. People have engaged in the type of activity that now, I think, raises people's concerns. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So I don't buy that Brockton is a crime-infested city. I do buy the fact that it's publicized. We have social media. We have 
print media, we have video, uh, television media, uh, but we're no different than any other city, as I said a few minutes ago. How long did you serve as a sworn officer? I was appointed in 1975, and except for the time I was in the mayor's office and served with Governor Weld, it was about, about uh, 2000, 2000 I retired, so 25 years here in the city. So when you look at gun violence, you have you have both the folks that say they have a right to bear arms and you have community leaders, community activists saying that we need to do more in terms of uh, controlling how our firearms are getting uh, on our city streets. Are you for stricter gun laws? I, I'm for stricter gun laws in the sense that I think it's nuts not to have a registry where if people have had uh, psychological issues, if they've been involuntarily confined to mm -hmm, a mental mm -hmm. institution, they clearly should not be uh, allowed to have access to a weapon. Uh, gun shows, I don't think you should be able to go into another state and purchase a gun, bring it back here and put it in your house. So if you enforce the laws that we have now, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and if you tweak some of the requirements, I think you would have a much safer system. I don't think it would be intrusive upon people's Second Amendment rights. But, but clearly the wrong people are getting guns. The legitimate gun owners I do not think are the problems but the people who should not have weapons, right. unfortunately, are rising to the forefront. Now, Councilor Farwell, it is no secret uh, that you are very concerned about how the city of Brockton looks. Yes. Uh, you've been a very strong advocate with respect to code enforcement, uh, basically, in, in, and I'm going to use my words, not your words, a reduction in blight, I would say. Could you give us um, your thoughts on what exactly is going on in terms of the removal of blight, code enforcement, and how they, we can uh, have some sort of connection with economic development in the city. Because I know that there's a lot of talk about affordable housing. Don't want to go too far, but t talk to us a little bit about your position on code enforcement. Well, code enforcement really is inspectional services, and mm -hmm. they have it in other large cities in Boston. It involves building inspections, it involves fire prevention inspections, it involves police inspections, wiring inspectors, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and I guess my position is that I think we've slipped a little bit in not having a comprehensive concerted effort to number one, attract economic development, but then work with the new business owners to make them aware of the different state and local regulations. And I'm not one for going into a business and shutting it down and hauling someone off to court on a first offense. I think a lot of it is education. I think we owe it to people who come into the city and invest and buy property and operate a business to get together with them and say, look, here are our regulations. They're here for a reason. They're here for fire prevention safety, for general public safety, but they're also here to enhance the look of the city. And when I go down to uh, Ward 4 in your area mm -hmm. on uh, Montello Street, right, right, right. or if I go down to Main Street in the Campello area and I see junk cars all around and I see vehicles parked on grass, which is against, if five or more vehicles parked outside are supposed to be on cement or macadam, it just mentions to me that I think we need a concerted but professional and fair and objective inspectional services arm of city government. Because otherwise we have unregulated right. businesses, and that's not fair to consumers. So are you talking in terms of, uh, so we, we you, no, new, no new ordinances need to happen? I, I don't think you don't so. Think there so. is one pending about uh, automobile repair okay. licenses okay. because we have so many. So you think that we have a, the loss on the books. Are you looking at increasing staffing in code enforcement? I, I do think you should increase staffing. I, I, I think that if you're serious about it, and, and particularly if we're going to have a downtown urban renewal project, right. which is going to span 10 or 15 years, then all of the feeder roads coming into the downtown area should be made as attractive as possible because we want people to come to the downtown area. And if they have to drive through what you mentioned is some urban blight, then that's going to be a, a shall we say, a barrier to them mm -hmm, mm -hmm. fully experiencing what the city has to offer. Uh, but, but I want to make it clear, and, and even with a law enforcement background, most of the time you educate people. Most of the time you get together with business people and you tell them what the requirements are, what the ordinances are, and you're almost always going to get cooperation. On those rare instances when someone just says, nope, I'm going to do it my way, then I do think you have to resort to uh, either a civil ticket or summons them into court. So we, uh, about a year ago, uh, some, of, some of the community leaders got together and we were really looking, especially in terms of the diversity of the city of Brockton, but really looking for an information center 
uh, that was multilingual, sponsored by the city of Brockton, piecing together what you're talking about, yep. understanding uh, the, the rules and regulations, understanding the rules of the road, would you support the municipality having something like that in City Hall, so, a place where everyone can come to, to receive the sort of information that you're talking about? I would not only support that, I would suggest to you that, for example, the building department is on the third floor of City Hall. True. It, it right. is true that you can come in by, by wheelchair, go up a ramp, mm -hmm. go to the elevator, go all the way up to the third floor and go in and get a building permit or apply for uh, an appearance before the Zoning Board of mm -hmm, Appeals. Mm -hmm. But I would suggest that down the road, and again, revenues are limited, I would suggest having a centralized office where you could go in and decide which permit you need, pay so you, for it, and, and then also disseminate the information you about support, the regulations. So you support the inf uh, an, inf an information center? Yes, I think centralizing yeah. the information yes. is key. All right. So, Council Farwell, you've mentioned revenue three times, so let's talk a little bit about revenue. What's your position on uh, maximizing our two-and-a-half levy? Well, I don't think the mayor had a choice. I mean, he, he made a decision to do that. If we had not done that, I think you would have seen more massive layoffs in the school system, and it might have had a ripple so effect. So it, it was a good decision? I, I th well, it, I, it's never good to try to take more money from people, but That's it was an unavoidable, right, right. It was an unavoidable okay. decision, and I don't, I don't think you can fault him for that because the consequences of not doing that would have been so dire. Um, in, in the going forward, I think that as a city, we have to work smarter. We have to try. Give to examples of that. Okay. Um, I think you need a hiring freeze on non-essential positions until you know what your FY19 wow, budget will wow. be. That's, In other words, yeah. why fill a clerical position yeah. and pay health benefits and increase the unfunded pension liability right, right, right. for a clerk in a, in, a, in a department until you know what fiscal year 19 is going to look like because I certainly don't want to have another catastrophic layoff of personnel. So I really think you have to establish clear, concise priorities. And obviously, you have to pill, fill uh, public safety positions. So, so Council, you know, uh, I, I know I look young, but I've been around the block for a while. I've, you are probably, in the 30 years that I've done this, the first person I've ever heard, politician, talk about a hiring freeze during an election year. Well. Uh, that's because I've reached the <laughs> age where the politics is less important to right. me in the city. Is, is, so you're is, concerned about the people, seriously. Yeah, you're yeah concerned the city about the is what's important. Right. And, and, you know, as you know, I worked for Governor Wells. Yes, I do. Yes, per I do. Perish yeah. the thought that I mentioned a Republican <laughs> name to you, knowing your background. That's, that's, but, that's okay. <laughs> but he always said one thing to all of us, and yeah. I remember being in a room with him. He said, take your work seriously. Correct. Don't yeah. take yourself too seriously. Right, right. And I think what he was saying is that government is going to go on, just make it the best you can, because someone's going to take your place later on in right, life. Right, right. And I, and I always lived by that. I mean, don't take yourself so seriously that, you know, you, you, you think you've got to fill every position and look good and, you know, uh, sponsor people for jobs. I, I think it's got to be an open, transparent right. process when you do the jobs. You, you know how I feel about yes, that. Yes, I do. Yeah. So, 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 we talked a little bit about the, the structuring of the revenue. Let's talk a little bit about diversity. Okay. A lot of conversations around sanctuary city designation. Tell us on the record, what are your thoughts? I think the sanctuary city uh, issue is not a good one because number one, uh, immigration should be a federal responsibility. Mm -hmm. I think the Congress has done a terrible job we have allowed thousands and thousands of people to come in here, and I think they ought to work out some, some type of a program where you could step forward, register, and then if you're here for a few years, expedite the citizenship process. But the sanctuary city thing really bothered me, and I'll give you an example. Let's assume Brockton had, had adopted that. And so now a young lady comes down to the police station. She's mm -hmm. undocumented. She's from, from another country. And she feels comfortable relating that either her car was stolen or she was assaulted or her house was broken into. She's comfortable with the police. When she goes to court to testify against any defendant or defendants, you can be sure that the defense counsel is going to tear that person apart. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. How long have you lived here? Where did you come from? Are you a U.S. citizen? And have you followed the law? So we've given someone a false sense of security. Unless it's done on a, on a nationwide basis, 
or certainly on a statewide basis, you've given someone that sense that they can report a crime, right. they're going to be all right with the police, and then when they enter the court system, it's open season on them. So you know, what frustrated me about the conversation last <coughs> year, um, and I tried to act as an inter, you know, I tried to act as a facilitator, but I guess my frustration was this didn't seem like our pol the, the conversation between our politicians and our advocates were making headway. I'm having this conversation with you about this. Did you have this conversation with any of the principals regarding uh, Sanctuary City saying that, giving this example, because you just taught me something. I never even thought about what yeah. would happen when they go to the district court. Yeah. Had you had this conversation with any of the advocates? I, I, I actually did. I have a woman oh. who lives in my neighborhood who called up and was lobbying me. Actually, two people called, excuse me, <coughs> lobbying me for support for this. And when I explained it to them, they did the same thing you did. They paused and they said, you know, I never thought about yeah, that. Yeah, I, really, I didn't. Yeah. And, and the other thing is, if the Brockton police followed it and the state police didn't, right. and the state police operate in here all the time, now you've got a mixed, a mixed message or a mixed, uh, a fragmented sense of protection. So, you know, frankly, the Congress has got to get off their rear ends and do something. I mean, it really should be addressed down in Washington, and it is a growing issue. I think it's an issue that has fragmented people in the country, and, and it's not really an issue that belongs before the city council. City council. Yeah. So, so Councilor, let me ask you this question around affordable housing. I moved to Brockton uh, thir maybe 31 years ago, started off on the, the, the high-rises and reservoir. You could get a two-bedroom for about $600, and it was a pretty modern building back then. Rents now, if you look at those buildings, are between sixteen, fourteen, and sixteen hundred dollars for a two-bedroom. Yeah. What in the heck is going on in terms of the rental market in the city of Brockton, and what could the, the city council do for that matter? The mayor's office could do in stabilizing these high rents. What's going on? Well, I think what's happened is that the demand exceeds the supply. So yeah. now the people who yeah. are supplying have found out that they're able to charge what you and I would think would be an exorbitant price it's based on years it's, ago. Right, right. It's, it's a house. But, but I do understand that people who own property, they need money to uh, pay taxes. Yes, they need I, we money agree. to, we agree. to uh, fix up the property. What can the city council do? I, I honestly don't know. I, I think, again, I think affordable housing is one of those issues mm -hmm. that should be carefully studied at the state level and that there should be some type of uniform either interventions or assistance that's offered because having a place to live and, and getting your kids educated and being safe is that's pretty much the basis of the American dream. Do you believe in a rent control model? I don't. You don't? No. Why? No. I, I don't think government should get into that because so, what's next? Price control? Right. I mean right, right. I might want to control the price of heating oil uh, so I think that's a bad I think that's a bad model I just don't think it tends to work as well as we think it does. So Gateway City designation you would support additional affordable housing uh, in, a, in a limited way, yes. I, I oh, you said limited. That well, scares I'll, me. I'll tell you oh, why. I, I, I worry about communities who embrace affordable housing, and they put a lot of it in a particular section of the city, ah. and they don't allow for green space. They don't allow for recreational yep. activities. They don't allow for people who may want to own more than one car because maybe both parents work. So you have to be careful. You don't warehouse people in an area where they really don't have access to the things that you and I make for a quality of life. And being able to take your kids to a playground or being able to go out and play catch. Uh, so so, so you, you, yeah. you really have to plan this very, very carefully. So, so, so but when, when, we do, so when we do the workouts for these sort of uh, affordable housing projects, why not suggest that as being a part of it? Cars need to be able to be parked off the street. We need to, we need to regulate green space. We need to set aside a certain amount of, I mean, the rule is you set aside a certain amount of units, but what we're hearing now, whether it's the city of Brockton or any other place across the Commonwealth, that the amount of affordable housing set aside is way, way too small. Uh, it could be 3%, 5%, 10%. You're not saying limit, limit that amount. You're talking more in terms of making sure that we have enough parking spaces, making sure that environmentally that sort of work is being done. Are you, but are you talking in terms of having a smaller portion of affordable 
housing set aside. Oh, I, I think some affordable housing is perfectly appropriate. In Brockton, by the way, I think the percentage is up around 12.6 percent. Okay, I, I okay, think fair we, enough. We, we have done quite a bit. What I worry about, and I, I hate to use the term, but it's warehousing people. Affordable right. housing sounds very good to a lot of people. Right. To housing advocates. You have to define it. <laughs> you have to define it. You have it. to define it, right. And, and right. you have to make sure that you offer people who live there basically the same opportunities that other people have for recreation, green space, safe parking. And the other thing that's so important, which I, I oftentimes think is overlooked, what will the effect be on a neighborhood school? For example, I understand they want to put uh, more affordable housing downtown at the old Kresge site. Right. Someone should pick up the phone and call Superintendent Kathy Smith and say, what effect will that have on the Arnone School if 20 or 30 kids come from that area? Right. Because that's what I, I mean by careful planning. Right. And, uh, and I think it's so important. Let me ask you, did you, were you, uh, did you take note of the uh, contentious relationship between our superintendent and our mayor. I think it appeared in the Brockton Enterprise about a month ago. She had made some comments uh, with respect to uh, whether or not the mayor was supporting the teachers. Did you pick that article up at all? You know, I, I did, but I actually didn't think it was contentious. I, I think there's a normal ebb and flow between <laughs> whoever is the chief executive right, right, officer right. I, and, I and whoever is a department head. Right. Because it's her position to advocate for as uh -huh. much funding as right. she can get because she knows it translates into programs and services. Right. He, on the other hand, or she, whoever is the mayor, has the headache of knowing there's, there's not an infinite amount of resources available, so where are we going to allocate it? Right. And, uh, and you're always going to have that. You so you, but my point is, so do you believe that we are doing right by our schools in terms of the, the formula and in terms of the dollars that the city is transferring to no, the school department? No, I, 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 I believe that there is a seriously flawed state formula mm -hmm. because the issues that present themselves in Brockton are very different than Newburyport or Marblehead Absolutely. or, or uh, Westfield or Braintree is a city now, Framingham right. is a city. We have children who move in and out. The ones who move in may be at grade five from the sending district but maybe they haven't had the excellent opportunity that we present and they're not at that grade level for Brockton. So now more resources have to be brought to bear. And I think someone, I don't know why they can't connect the dots in Boston, right, right, right. someone has got to sit down and say certain communities are in a different category. Right. Brockton is in a different category. So there ought to be a weighted formula based on whatever criteria you want to use so that additional resources come to the city of Brockton. So you, you, you would support the lawsuit? Oh, absolutely. And, and, and you know, unfortunately, probably the, the greatest decisions in this country have come through the courts I know. rather than legislative it, it decisions. Is true. It is true. And so I'm afraid that this, that's what's going to happen. But I hope the SJC still has all of that body of knowledge and all of the filings from 20 or 30 years ago so we don't have to keep take five or six years to decide this. so you, you realize so this political series was supposed to be a partnership with both an incumbent and new candidates that are running for at large yeah. we had invited Pam uh, Gurley who unfortunately yesterday she told me that she couldn't make it uh, so this gives you some more time to have uh, a, 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 a little bit more discussion with me I'm pausing because I wanted to ask you uh, a question about the Lopes case but I also don't want to take up your time in terms of you giving your closing argument. Do you have any thoughts about the Lopes case? Oh, I, I, I'm glad you mentioned the Lopes okay. case, and, and, and I'll tell you why. Yeah. Um, it's the year 2017. Right. When you have an employment position open in a municipality, I don't care whether it's Brockton or it's the town of East Ham down on the Cape, there ought to be a fair, open, competitive process for people to make application, to be fairly judged by their past experience, their education, their training, their suitability for the particular position, personal and business references, and, and really to do anything else, I think, is to undermine the support that the taxpayers give us. Because you know what? Those salaries are all paid by taxpayer dollars. So I had uh, Mayor Carpenter here about uh, a month ago, and I asked him one of the questions that the community, uh, you know, I basically had surveyed some of the community members, some questions they would ask him. And one of the things that they brought to my attention was, ask them should he apologize on behalf of the city of Brockton for what happened to Mr. Lopes. What's your position on that? 
Well, I think now that it's still in litigation, you, you, you kind of have to hold your powder. Mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. I can tell you, I would hope that if I had been the mayor when Mr. Lopes applied, the department head and, the, and as the mayor signing the personnel action forms, we would have made sure that the best possible candidate was appointed. As you know, Councillor Tom Monaghan and I put through a, a fairly comprehensive ordinance to that effect because, again, it's, it's the right thing to do. I mean, I, I know it sounds simplistic to say that, but government should do the right thing. In terms of the Lopes case and really having, for, in, in terms of the city of Brockton, get higher marks in terms of diversity, do you have any, other than the ordinance, do you have any other suggestions around how we can better diversify a municipality outside of the mayor's office? You walk into the mayor's office, it looks diverse, looks like it represents the city of Brockton, but then you look at the, some of the other offices, maybe with the exception of election, it looks pretty majority, if I can use that terminology. What other suggestions might you have? Well, there are a number of sites that you can use to advertise positions. The Mass Municipal Association has one. School Spring is another very uh, good website where you can advertise educational positions. You know, the interesting thing about uh, minority teachers is that the, the minority college graduates are smart enough not to go into education mm -hmm. because it doesn't pay as much as business and law That's and medicine. True. And nationwide, that is a problem, attracting minority candidates to teach. But given social media and given all of the various websites that exist, which are pretty cost effective, right. the city can always do more. So, you, you, so you are, you're picking up kind of where the Diversity Commission as well as the NAACP who's been meeting with um, the school department. So you, you really believe that we need to increase the pipeline. Oh, absolutely. It, because it reassures the public that the money they're sending into us, right. whether it's through state aid or local tax dollars, that we are spending it appropriately. We're hiring the best possible people for these jobs. And look, I'm going to be honest with you. Most people feel that the politicians call the shots. <laughs> well, they, you they, call they, they, up and you say, listen, hire yeah, my next door yeah, neighbor yeah, because right. they're good friends of mine. Right. Right. That has to stop. That's it, it's got to stop if right. it hasn't. It just well, has you, to. Well, you know, you you and I have both been around a while, so it's it's the old machine politics. Yep. And one of the things I tell people that it is it is not distinctively different from any other municipality in the country, not just in the Commonwealth, but in the country. Really quickly, because I do want you to give your closing argument. Changing of the terms for city councilor and mayor's office. What's your position? That should be studied. And, that should and, be studied. That you, should be studied. I'll tell you why. There's too yeah. much fundraising and too little policy making. You're always basically running for right, right. for re-election or for election and it, it, it's just madness. So I need you to give your closing argument, make sure you look at the camera and give your contact information and we're thanking you for coming in today. Well thank you. Uh, I'm Wynn Farwell. I'm one of four counselors at large. I can't thank the residents of this city enough for the opportunity to serve as a counselor at large. Uh, my cell phone number is 508 Two seven two nine eight eight zero. I live at ninety four Braymore Road in Brockton. It's been a real honor to serve. It's been a great pleasure to work with the other councilors. We have a lot of important issues coming up. Uh, some of them are very near and dear to me, such as expanding community policing and neighborhood crime watch, fixing streets, some of which have not been done in thirty or forty years, and making sure that we have full transparency in city government including how your money is being spent and the people we hire for city positions. So again, I, there's no adequate, adequate way of saying thank you for the honor you've given me. And uh, I would ask for your support on September 19th during the uh, preliminary election in Brockton. Ladies and gentlemen, this has been Wynn Falwell, city councilor at large running for re-election. Do not forget the election is the primary September 19th 2017. Make sure you look at the uh, City of Brockton's website to get your precinct locations. Listen, God bless you and thank you for tuning in to the NAACP Forum because we are Brockton's voice when it comes to civil rights news.